This conference will now be recorded. Mm. Oh, there you go. That's all right. Okay. Tonight we have oh, Revelation Made New, um, or Everything is New. Um, and we're going to be discussing the last session in our um, in our talks on Revelation tonight. And yeah, this one's basically on based on mostly based on Revelation um, 20 and 21, but we're going to have a look at a lot of other things as well. But the first place I want to look at is chapter 22, verse 12. <clears throat> this, I think, is probably the theme of the whole, the whole book, <clears throat> where Jesus says, Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. So what I want to do tonight is to look at those promises of eternity, those promises that Jesus is coming soon, and what we've seen over the last, how long have we been doing this? Year? Give or take, or two, okay. Over the last year or two, what we've seen is a whole lot of events that that, that we've, we've looked at as, as prophecies and we've looked at them as current events and we've looked at them as historic events we've looked at them as, as coming events but what they've taught us is that jesus is coming soon and over and over through this last chapter of revelation he he restates that behold i am coming soon and my reward is with me um so you know that's what's important and what we're going to look at tonight is what happens when he comes soon for us. Last week we looked at, at essentially the judgments that were coming. Thank you, Andrew. The judgments that were coming and the judgments on the beasts and everything and, and the dragon and, and, and all, the, all their cohorts. Today we're going to look at the other side of the story because now he says, my reward is with me. This is the reward for us. This is what we are looking forward to. So, so that's what I want to look at tonight, the, the promises of God for eternity. And like, you know, not everyone has a, a great vision of the kingdom. Um, you know, sometimes sometimes we think that, well, you know, I've talked to, I've talked to a lot of people who just don't have much in the way of vision. People who wonder if they're going to be in the kingdom or not. And I think a lot of it comes down to, to this verse, which says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Which means that if we take that verse, we can pretty much sit back and go, hmm, okay, so... We can't imagine it, so there's no point even trying. There's no point. There's, you know, there's all those prophecies there. Okay, we could just like, hey, God's got something in store for us. But, yeah, yep, we can we can work with that. But we need to remember what the next verse in First Corinthians two says. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. That's the context. And the spirit of God, the spirit of his word is, is here, right here. There is so much in the scriptures about the kingdom of God. And we're going to cover just a tiny little bit of that tonight. And, and there's so much more. And you go through Isaiah, you go through, through a whole lot of the different prophets and everything, and there is so much more to cover. But we're just going to have a look at what we find from Revelation tonight. It's just That's all we're going to look at tonight. Um, but we need that vision to get us through. So if I can encourage you to do anything tonight, I would encourage you to start a revelation, do what we've done tonight, just go through it verse by verse and go, what does the Bible say? Because that's what we're going to do. And then, and then go through the rest of the scriptures and go, what else does it say about the kingdom of God? because it'll give you that vision and it'll give you that hope and it'll give you that motivation. That's what it's for. Um, let's start then with Revelation chapter 1. Now, I've got, I, just, I just read through Revelation 
and I've picked out verses that um, that I think talk about the kingdom. So the first one is Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's a, he's going to rule now, and he's going to rule later. He's made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve God and His Father. <clears throat> um, so that's what that's our role. To Him be glory and power forever and ever. Now that's a phrase that comes up, or, or a concept that's going to come up over and over through Revelation. The fact that He deserves all praise for all eternity. And the Lord God says, "I am the Alpha and Omega, who is and who was." So we've seen who he was, we've seen who he is now, and who is to come, the Almighty. So this is like forever and ever. It's just in chapter 1. Chapter 1 is pretty much one of the the chapters with less in it. Chapter 2 and 3 I've lumped together. And sorry for the small print, but I did want to lump them together. So if you want to turn up chapters 2 and 3, you'd be able to see it easier in your Bible. But I was quite keen on this because chapters 2 and 3 are the letters to the Ecclesias. Now, there's a really neat pattern in Revelation. You've got, you've got seven seals, seven trumpets, seven, uh, seven thunders, seven, what else have we got? Vials, that's right. So you've got all these sevens, and at the end of each of those sevens, there comes a, a kingdom prophecy. You've seen that? as we've been through, right? Yes, right. It's the same in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. You've got seven different ecclesias, and at the end of each ecclesia, there's a little kingdom prophecy, and it's there. There's there's a specific reason it's there. It's there to tell us what happens if we overcome. And at the beginning of each one of them, it says, to the one who is victorious or to the one who overcomes. I will give. So this is what we can get. I'm going to turn around this way because it's easier to read than this tiny little bit here. Oh, actually, I can read it here. <clears throat> to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The neat thing is the tree of life was originally in Genesis, early Genesis, and it was the tree that Adam and Eve were able to eat from to be able to stay alive. It was the staying alive tree. All right? So, you know, we get to read of the tree of life. I, I shouldn't take so long over these. Um, to the one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. We heard about the first and second resurrections yesterday, um, or last week, where the, the, your first death when we die now, there's a chance of being resurrected. But if we die again after we're resurrected, no, there's no, there's nothing left. That's it. We won't be hurt by the second death. To the one who is victorious, in verse 17, I will give some of the hidden manna. And again, another sign of, of eternal life, because the hidden manna was in the pot, and it didn't die. Um, I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. This is God's name for you. I think that's really cool. Just like, you know, I have names that I call Sharon and other people have names that they call me. My mum calls me Pet. You know, like (laughs) pet names, you know. Um, You know, we all have an, an adorable name for the people we love. And that's what God's giving to us. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. Um, And in the end of uh, chapter 2, I will give that one the morning star. Um, Chapter 3, to write, they that overcome will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. To the one who is victorious in verse 5, will, like them, be dressed in white, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Verse 12, to the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. 
and I will write on them the name of my God and the city of my God and the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven. And in verse 21, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. And one of the interesting things to note in this, in the, um, in the letters to the Ecclesias, is that the, the more these people had to overcome, the richer the reward is that is described. The less they had to overcome, you know, if your Ecclesia was really good and just, you know, just getting on with it and everything, there wasn't so much, so much recorded as a reward. But if the Ecclesia was sort of like on the wrong track and you had to really move to, 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 to overcome, there was a lot greater reward offered, which is interesting. So, Revelation 7 now um, is another chapter that, that we get a really strong kingdom vision. First, we get the vision of the 144,000, which we have talked about, and someone said that, that we could be them, so take note of that. Um, I think we, personally, I think we sort of tend to, to appear in verse 9. After this I looked, and before me there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes, and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to, to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And then there's a whole lot of praise from some angels. And then in verse 15, again, we get some, um, we get a description of who these people were in the white robes. Um, these are they before the throne, and they serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat, for the Lamb at the centre of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of living waters, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. We'll come back to that concept in a, in a little bit when we come to chapter 20. Um, but yeah, you get, you're get starting to get that picture of what it, what Revelation is telling us about, about the good things that are to come that God has promised. Now, Revelation 10, we get an interesting one. Um, actually, turn this one up because I haven't put the whole context in. But um, in Revelation 10, you get the first four, and it says, And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. Now, that gets me interested. We... we, we, we um, had an interesting load in our um, trolley the other day when we came home from the airport from Invercargill and um, big pieces of wood sticking up out of the trolley and the person we parked next to said, oh, what's that? I said, I don't think you want to know. She goes, I'm interested now. You'll have to tell me. I said, well, it's a coffin. Okay, so anyway... <laughs> She goes, oh, I'm in that business. I'm an embalmer. <laughs> Who would have known? But, but, you know, and it's the same thing here, you know. Like, like, we don't know what's in those seven thunders. We don't know what those seven thunders said. So now I'm interested. What did they say? Why won't you tell us, John? Why won't, why won't Jesus let you tell us? What did they say? Can you just give me a sneak preview? So I was thinking about this. And it come to Revelation chapter 10. And um, and what you need to, to remember is that in the beginning of chapter 9, you've got the fifth angel sounded his trumpet. So we're, we're in the middle of the trumpets somewhere. And then in, in verse 13 of chapter 9, we've got the sixth angel sounding his trumpet. Now, if you think about the sixth seal and the sixth trumpet, and most of the six ones, they start to have a bit of a prophecy about the coming judgment or the coming um, kingdom. Before we head into the seventh whatever, and it leads us into the next, the next activity. 
And so here we are in the sixth seal from chapter 9. And we're still in that sixth seal because the seventh seal comes somewhere else. Chapter 11, verse 15, is that right? Yep. Yep, okay. Um, so, yeah, seventh trumpet comes later on. So we're still in the midst of that sixth trumpet. And I wonder whether it was sealed up because it's just too good for us to comprehend. It'll blow your mind. Now, have a look at 2 Corinthians 12, verse 4. And I, this is what this is what gave me the clue because here's another here's another really frustrating part of scripture that um, that I always go, come on, what was it? And you probably already know exactly where I'm going with this. But um, Paul had a vision, and he's he's boasting to the Corinthians, and he's going, although there's nothing to be accomplished, I'm going to go on to my vision. And I know this man, verse 3, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows. He was caught up into paradise and he heard inexpressible things that a man is not permitted to tell. So what did you see, Paul? And I reckon he was caught up into the kingdom of God, into, into the, the time beyond the thousand years. And he was, this is what I believe anyway, and he was given that vision of, of what was beyond the thousand years and it was just too much for him to either describe or too much for for us to cope with one or the other and i think that's what the seven trumpets are doing as well that's just my opinion so anyway um and then verse seven the mystery of god will be accomplished so that's that's my opinion on um on the seven trumpets and i might be wrong but you know Take it or leave it. Right, Revelation 11. <clears throat> the kingdom of this world has become, these are my most famous words in the whole of Revelation, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah and he will reign forever and ever. No need to expand on that. He will. We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and was because you have taken your great power and begun to reign. And in verse 19, and God's temple in heaven was opened and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant and here we like i think this is an amazing concept because because the whole of um revelation really revolves around the tabernacle and i think we saw that in the first couple of talks that we did on revelation and the most holy place was where the Ark of the Covenant was. And I think we'll, we'll see this a little bit later on as well, but the, the, the Ark of the Covenant and the, the holiest place is like where eternity is going to be spent. So we'll see that a little bit later on. Chapter 12, I only got one verse in chapter 12. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come salvation and power and the kingdom of God and the authority of the Messiah. And you can sort of hear that praise building up. Chapter 14. We've got the Lamb and the 144,000 and a noise like rushing water and, and thunder. Um, and they sung a new song before the Lord, before the throne and the four living creatures and the elders. Um, so again, Depending on your thoughts on the 144,000, there's another interesting part of um, the, the kingdom prophecies of Revelation. Chapter 15. I saw what looked like a sea of glass in verse 2, glowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. And they held um, harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty, and true and just to your ways, King of the nations, who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name, for you alone are holy, and all nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Again, that, that 
really beautiful picture of praise in the kingdom of God. And in chapter 19, another amazing picture of praise. And I think also we need to remember that, like, everything we are and everything we have is given to us by God. And then he takes us who are sinners, you know, probably, I mean, even a dog and a cat will do what it's supposed to do. But we go and do the wrong things. And yet God takes us and he says, I'm going to give you his, my kingdom. And oh, what an amazing blessing that is. Um, so, yeah, in verse 5, then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you servants who fear him, both great and small. And then there's the loud multitude again shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord God reigns. Um, let us rejoice and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made himself ready. Let them rejoice. That's what, part, that's what the kingdom is going to be about. It's about rejoicing. And who's feeling bored or miserable when they're rejoicing? Anyone here? Like, oh, I'm so happy. I'm so bored. You know, I'm so bored. I'm happy. No, not really. It doesn't work either way. So, you know, when we've got that full, full on attitude of rejoicing, we are not going to be bored for eternity. Possibly. Yes. You don't enjoy singing now. Get used to it. <laughs> but there may be other things to do too, like banging a drum. You know, there's, there's, there's got to be, God's created all sorts of different people in all sorts of different ways. But, you know, I think that, that whole rejoicing thing is a, is a really, um, it's, it's something that's really important to remember. And wearing fine linen, which is the, um, the righteous acts of God's holy people, and invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And if you have a look in, in Isaiah 26, you can see that described in detail. We come to Revelation 20. We're almost to 21 and 22. Um, so, yeah, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, in verse 6, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Blessed and holy are those who share in that first resurrection. I think that's, an, that's a really awesome promise. If we are those who share in that first resurrection when Christ returns or are taken to be with him at his, at his return, and that's where we've got to aim. Because if we don't aim for that, we'll miss the mark. Right, Revelation 21. Now, this is really our topic tonight. Um, a new heaven and a new earth. I remember when um, I was on the board of trustees at, at one of the primary schools our kids went to, and we had to, one of our jobs was to find a new principal because the old principal retired. She was. Oh, she must have just hit sixty-five, and she was. She was. She was pretty good. She was right in touch with the kids, but she was. Um, she'd been there for about twenty-five years or something, and she was pretty stale as well. Anyway, I remember being at this last assembly with her, and and she did the, the assembly, and people were giving tributes and all that sort of stuff, and I was sitting next to one of the other board members, Sue, and. Um, Anyway, the assembly finished and everyone clapped and she whispered, she leaned over and she whispered to me in a very loud stage whisper, out with the old, in with the new. <laughs> and um, yeah, and I can like, I, I just totally remember that, but it's exactly what we're looking forward to here because the new heaven and a new earth is, is the, the new order of things that God is going to create 
is going to be incredible. It will be out with the old and with the new. And you look at the world around us now and it's tired and and worn out and and polluted and polluted with immorally as well. And you know, it's just it's just that. <laughs> so I am looking forward to the day when I can go out with the old, in with the new, and here's Jesus. And yeah, sure, it's not gonna be it necessarily all fun and games because because like when we had the new principal come in he he put his plans in place and a lot of the teachers didn't like it you know and it's within within a couple of years the whole staff had cleared out and did a whole new stuff and um because they'd all got so used to the old way of doing things but that's where we need now to be preparing for what it's going to be like when Christ returns, to be thinking about it, to have that vision in our hearts so that when he comes, we will be ready for the new. Um, so uh, that, those verses highlighted, those words highlighted there, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. See, God is the one who created the universe. He holds the key to unlimited secrets of nature and he can control its most powerful forces, which is the word from his mouth. He's the artist who paints the sunrises. He's the artist who paints the sunsets and rainbows. He hung the stars in the sky. He created molecules and, and atoms and anything smaller. Yeah, sure. Yeah, probably is. So I just thought I'd ask the chemist. <laughs> Bits of rubber. Um, he knows us and he, and he cares for us and all that we do. And he wrote us the, the, the beautiful love letter that we all have in front of us. And he wants us in his kingdom. And he's offering to, to share his glory and to forgive our sins and to give us the hope of everlasting life. And we have a such an awesome God and all that and he wants to live with us I just find that incredible you know and we could go on and on about how great he is but he wants to live with you in person and I reckon that's one of the most ultimate things to look forward to. You know, and like I'm not saying I'm not saying I believe in going to heaven. Just just get straight on this. But whether the kingdom is on earth or whether it's in heaven or whether it's on Mars or anywhere else, I don't actually care. As long as I could be with God and with Jesus, that's what matters. I want to dwell with them wherever they are. Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He's taking away that old order. The order of oppression, the order of of you know, the, the political orders, the, the everything orders. And it's creating a new world. And I was thinking about this verse this morning and I was going, um, just thinking about my year, just this last year. I've had a couple of deaths. I've had a lot of pain. Hip pain, back pain, headaches. I've we've, we've had losses. We're going through a whole lot of change that we're not really knowing that we're prepared for. Um, I named a whole lot of things before, and I can't think of them right now. But yeah, I've had depression, and yeah, it's just been. It's been a year of a lot of pain and a lot of 
mourning and a lot of crying and death and none of that is is going to be around when Christ returns. And I want you to think about this in a way that, like, you strip away all those things. You go, okay, like, I'm not going to have pain anymore. That would be great. Like, standing here, I've got pain. I've got sciatic pain. It's just standing here talking to you. Take that away. Oh, that would be awesome. Give me the energy that I've that I haven't had for a few years. That'd be even awesomer. Um, you know, take away that that mourning that we've that we've had to deal with. You know, so that we don't ever have to go through that again. Wow. Take away the the tears that we that we've cried, so we don't have to cry tears of 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 sadness anymore and i can imagine there will be tears in the kingdom of god but tears of happiness and what are you left with when you take all that stuff away what are you left with i think you're left with joy you're left with peace and you're left with love and what an amazing thing that would be where God just strips all that from us. And it says, and he, is that in there? It must, might be in another place. And he will wipe away the tears from your eyes. Oh, yes, it is there. Sorry, yeah, very, the very first words. <laughs> he will do it personally. I think that's just, wow, sorry. So, you know, what? what's left at the end? When everything's gone, there'll be life, joy, and peace. God's ultimate aim is to have us as joyful people with him throughout eternity. And yes, we're going to experience unpleasant things of our life for now, but in the meantime, we also need to practice giving God what he really wants, the joy every moment that we can and press on for the joy that is set before us. <clears throat> and he who was seated on the throne said in verse 5, I'm making everything new. Write these things down, for these are trustworthy and true. I remember when um, Sharon's parents went and moved into their retirement village, um, and they bought this, they bought the, the house, that they, the unit that they, they lived in, and at the time it was pretty worn out someone had been using it the carpet was dirty the you know the, the walls were sort of everything was very tired and the, and the village said um by the time you move in in a couple of months time it'll be brand new and man they did paint the walls were painted there were new curtains there was new carpet there was a new kitchen there was a new bathroom the plumbing was all new the the, the, the light switches were all new everything was new that's exactly what God is going to do to this world. Everything is new. Um, if we love and serve him, then we will inherit the earth. And if the earth seems a bit tired after 6,000 years of humans living on it, then God will renovate. I'm making everything new, he said. And if the retirement village could do a good job, then I reckon God can do an even better job with the whole planet. So, carrying on through Revelation 21, one of the seven angels came and said to me, does someone else want to read this? That would make my life more interesting, wouldn't it? First nine? Yep, first nine to 14. I will show you a bride, the man's wife. And he carried him away, me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, 
who give life to life unto the stone most precious, even like a just stone, clear as crystal. It had a wall, great and high, and twelve gates, and it gates twelve angels, and his name was written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles were made. Great. And I get someone to read from verse 16 to 20. One. Anyone want to read 16 to 21? Thanks, Ray. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the road and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth brilliance, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jasper. And the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were the twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent ones. Right, and verse 20, what, 22 to 27. Someone else? I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb of its people. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the land is its land. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor to it. On no day will its gates be shut, for there will be no night for them. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful people, only those whose names are written in the land of life. Right, so we just read about the New Jerusalem. Now I just want to share with you a bit of a thought here. I um, hope you're concentrating through those verses. But what, what I've got, I've got several different, several different aspects here. Nebuchadnezzar's image, we have um, the, the or a dream we have the story of the image, which which you know about, and then it says there was a rock cut out without hands. Now, I always get frustrated with this picture, and it was the only picture I could, well, I couldn't find the picture with the white-shaped stone in it, but it says the stone was cut out of a mountain without hands. Now, that means, that, that to me, says it wasn't a boulder that just sort of fell out of the mountain without hands. It was cut. When you cut a stone, it's square, just like a cornerstone. So the cornerstone there, Psalm 118, 22, is also the same as what Jesus says about himself in Matthew 21, where he says, um, I, um, oh, well, I'll have to look it up. Matthew 21, verse 44. <clears throat> I know roughly what it says, but I'm going to get it wrong. <clears throat> Um, oh, verse, yeah, verse 44. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. And he's talking about the, the, the cornerstone there and he himself being the cornerstone. So if you fall on the cornerstone, you get broken, but if you, but if it falls on you, you get crushed. And when you read about in Daniel, you hear about the crushing because the stone comes down and it grinds to pieces and it's as fine as the dust on the threshing floor and it's crushed and it blows away, right? But if you, let's have a look at the, the first Peter quote, first Peter 2 verses 4 and 8, to 4 to 8. Hmm. 
He says, as you come to him, the living stone, so here we have that same stone, the cornerstone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, so keep that preciousness in mind, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Did you notice that? You are living stones built into this, into this house, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And he talks about the cornerstone again. So if you're a living stone, but you're a precious living stone, you're a bit like the amethyst in the, in the picture there. Because you look like a stone, but when you fall on the, on the rock, you get broken. And what shows? The beauty of what's inside. And that's what we talked about in Ron and Darren's, Darren's um, Bible class series Dust on the Diamonds. Dust of Diamonds. That's the one. Yeah. And then... We read about the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Its size is mentioned. It's, it's the same width as it is high as it is long, just like a cornerstone, just like the, the, the inside of the most holy place, which was a, an absolute cube as well, and made, out of very, made very precious. And... And having and made out of living stones, and all those foundations are made out of precious stones. So we're all part of that. And then you have the 12 gates, which are made out of 12 pearls. And the way a pearl is created is when it has a bit of irritation in there and it covers the irritation and grows over up and over and over and over until it makes something really, really beautiful. And the only way into this new holy city, Jerusalem, is through the gates with the pearls. And what I need thought is that in, that, in that the only way, Paul says, Paul and Barnabas said in another place, the only way to get into the kingdom of God is through, through tribulation. We, we get into the kingdom by through tribulation. Sorry, I'm... Um, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And here we are going through those hardships that have refined us into pearl-like pearl -like precious jewels. What a brilliant picture of, of the kingdom. So as we walk through the pearls to enter New Jerusalem, we'll see what has become of the hardships and irritations in our lives that they've been covered with patience and forgiveness and love. And it's only through the pearls that we can can get into the kingdom of God. I don't think it'd been. I think they're probably I, I suspect there are twelve oysters there somewhere in the in the in the sea that are growing absolutely huge. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think there's twelve oysters down there with great big pearls inside them. That's my that's my theory. I'm sticking to it. We might all end up being small. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in Revelation twenty two we get the, the picture of the, the river of the water of life flowing and Psalm 1 and Ezekiel 47 are great, um, great things, great places to look at that. And I just love when you've got so many allusions in Psalm 1. I'm not going to go into them all now because we're running, running out of time. But there are so many allusions in Psalm 1 to Revelation chapter 22. Um, and I love the way Psalm 1 starts. How happy is the man who um, walks in the way of the Lord. What a brilliant start to the word. The blessed, blessed or how happy is that person? You know, and it just gives you that kingdom picture of that happiness, that joy that we're going to share. 
Um, no longer will there be any curse. Um, and verse 12, he says, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me. And that's where we started. And we're sort of, we've, well, I've been trying to show you the reward. I've probably been a little bit boring. But I've been trying to show you the reward tonight as shown in Revelation. And his reward is with him. And notice he doesn't say that his, he's, I'm coming to judge you. It's his reward is with him. To give each person according to what he has done. And yeah, if you've, if you've, done really nasty things i'm sure there will be really nasty rewards but but for those of us who are really trying to serve him he's got a real he's got a reward and that's what he's coming with for us <clears throat> blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to enter through the to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life and share in the tree of life in the holy city, which are described in this scroll. And so, oh, that's right, there it is. <clears throat> we are really blessed to have the message of revelation from john the angel said to him at the end in, in revelation 22 verse 10 do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll because the time is near and what that means for us is that we're able we are free and able to read the vision that was left for us and with our with attention to it we can we can i come to understand it the words are not sealed up so that we can't read and we can't understand them. They're left open for us to learn and to grow by. And the other reason the words of this prophecy haven't been sealed up is because the time is near. And it's important for us to read and understand the message of Revelation in order to face the last days with the strength we need to overcome. If we had no idea what was happened, what was going to happen before the return of Christ, we would be totally unprepared and our faith might not survive the hardships we might have to face. But having been forewarned, we can face and face those things and prepare and overcome. So just to conclude our Revelation study, let's not put this book aside. Because now more than ever, as the time draws near, we need to be familiar with this message to be strengthened by its encouragement, even if we think it's too hard to understand, so that with prayer and by persistence, we can all learn something about the way we should live, what God wants from us, and place the glorious hope of eternity higher in our minds. Let's rejoice that the revelation has not been sealed up so that we cannot hear its message. And let's read it and be strengthened by it so that we will be ready for our Lord's return. He is coming soon. Behold, he said, I come quickly. And so that's where we'll leave it. Did that unrecord? trying to unrecord this but it doesn't seem to want to unrecord someone can unrecord oh here we go someone's done it for me thank you